Okay, so I'm again with Frederick. He's again a postdoc instructor. <laughs> is still again uh, a member of MSP. <laughs> He's going to talk to you about formal verification. Mm. Again, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so my my mm. was to talk about formal verification theory in general, but I'm just going to tell you how to do these kind of things in independent types and in particular in Agda, which is a programming language slash proof assistant with dependent types. So it'll be some kind of tutorial on using Agda to write correct software, I guess. And so this is based on material by Andreas Abel, who in turn is based his tutorial on a paper by, by Connor, who is one of uh, our colleagues in the MSP group. So th this is a very nice paper, which I can recommend to read. But I'm not going to assume that you know anything about Agda, so let's start with a hopefully gentle introduction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is Agda. Uh, it's running in Emacs. These things are comments, and these are data type declarations. So we're going to declare some basic data types, and then we'll talk about how to represent logic in this system. So this is one of the simplest types you can imagine, right? The booleans. Uh, so we introduce it by saying this is a data type, we give it a name, bool, it's a type, so we call it the set, and it has two elements, true and false, and they both are type bool. Right? So I'm just listing the elements of the boolean, so this is a very simple kind of type you can have. Right? Uh, you could get a little bit fancier by introducing the natural numbers, by saying that natural numbers is a set, it has two constructors, zero is a natural number, and if I have a natural number n, then successor of n will also give me a natural number. This is exactly what Neil was doing earlier in natural deduction form. But in Agda we write it as constructors like this. <coughs> and so this is how we introduce things. If we want to eliminate or uh, compute the data, then we do it by pattern matching. So here I want to define addition on natural numbers. So this is a function which takes two natural numbers and gives me a third one. And it has this name, the underscores tells Agda where the argument should go, so this way you can get mix fix operators. So I'm defining n plus n. And here I have a hole, there's something I had yet still have to fill in in order to complete this definition. So let's see if we can do it. So how do we do it? Well, we have to look at one of the natural numbers. Right? So let's look at the first one. So I do this by typing n in the hole and then doing control C, control C to make, make a case split. And I get the two different cases for what the first thing could be. So it could either be zero or a successor. Okay, so now we, we've reduced our problem to two problems. We have to say what zero plus m is and we have to say what suck n plus m is. Right, so zero plus m should just be m. So we can fill this in put it in the hole, and then the type checks it to make sure that it has the right type, which it does, and it's happy, uh, so the goal has disappeared. Right? And now we're left with this goal, we have to say what suck m plus m is. So what is m plus 1 plus m? Well, by recursion, we know what m plus m is, because this n is smaller than suck m. So if you do this, then this will terminate. And if I don't take another suck outside this, and this should do the job, right? So this is 1 plus n plus m, this is 1 plus n plus m. In different brackets. Let's see if that accepts that. It does. It can reload the file just in case. And okay, and then I've added a pragma to say that these natural numbers are really the natural numbers, which means that I can write uh, link logs instead. So now I can try to evaluate an expression. So let's try to evaluate 17 plus. 42, and we get 59 back. Right? So what's happening behind the scenes is that we are running these equations again. Pattern matching on 17 to see if it's zero or successor, and it's a successor, so we replace that with this and keep going. Right? So, so far, this is exactly what you would do in any functional programming language. Just have some nice support by Agda to, uh, to tell us the types of things and to, to fill in 
What does it mean to connect to the built-in natural model? So it means if I means you get some extra syntactic sugar. So if I comment this out, reload the file, and now try to evaluate 17 plus 42, then I will complain that it doesn't know what 17 is. Uh-huh. So since the natural numbers is the most important data type in the world, we have some special syntax for it. Uh, so here's another data type of lists, which we'll use in the latter part. So again, it's very similar, right? I'm de declaring a data type. I'm calling it list. But this time I have a parameter, which is a set A. And I'm claiming that this is a set. It's given by two constructors. It's either the empty list, which is from nil, which is a list, or it's a cons, which I'll write with two colons. So I put the first argument here and the second argument here. And if the first argument is an element of A, and the second argument is a list of A's, then I get the list of A out. Okay, and then there's some, some command to tell Agda how to disambiguate if I'm not putting all the brackets in. So it's annoying, but it's it nice if you put it in. Uh, okay, so that, this way we can do functional programming in Agda. Right? We have these basic data types, we can do our basic definitions of functions, but we can also represent logic using this. So this is called the curry howard as morphism after Haskell Curry and uh, how it's first name? Curry. Yeah. Haskell Curry and Curry Howard, yes of course. Um, okay, you can look now. So uh, these were logicians from uh, the, the early 20th century and they had this idea that you can actually represent logic or propositions as types and proofs then becomes program under this equivalent. So I made a little table how you do this and we can walk through it slowly. So here's standard logical connectors, right? And, or, implies, truth, false, exists for all. And here are some types that I'm claiming represent these things. So that's it. What does it mean to have a proof of A and B? Well, it means that you have a proof of A and you have a proof of B, right? So that's exactly what a Cartesian product gives you. Saying that you have two things and together you get something else. What does it mean to have a proof of A or B? Well, it means that you have a proof of A or you have a proof of B. Right? That's exactly what the disjunct union gives you. you have one or the other. What does it mean to have a proof of an implication? Well, it means that if Neil gives me a proof of A, then I can produce a proof of B from this information. Right? That's exactly what the function space is doing taking in proofs of the first thing and producing proofs of the second thing. What does it mean to have a proof of truth? Well, it's just true. So that's what the unit type is. It has some proof. There's an element of the unit type representing the truthiness of the unit type. What does it mean to have a proof of false? Well, there shouldn't be any proofs of false. That's exactly what the empty type does, right? Um, what does it mean to have a proof <laughs> of there exists an x such that p of x? Well, it means that I should have a witness and a proof that this witness satisfies P of X. So this is what's called a sigma type, and we're going to define it further down here. And finally, what does it mean to have a proof of for all X, P of X? Well, it means that I have some method of if you give me an X, then I can prove P of X for you. Right? So again, this is like a function, but it's a function where the codomain of the function depends on the element I get in, so it's a dependent function. So up to this point, where it's just propositional logic, you don't need dependent types in order to represent these things. You can do this in Haskell today if you want it. Right? But in order to do the first order logic, so exists and for all, you do need the dependent types to represent these things. Okay. So. Uh, when you say first order logic or propositional logic, now you can, you're basically able to start to implement those logic connectors, but do you have the freedom to define your own inference rules? Or do you have to stick to the inference rules that you like? Are the inference rules defined by the environment? <coughs> or can you basically use this stuff to type, check proofs in other logic systems? So it's <coughs> when I choose to implement this in terms of and, that is implicitly fixing the inference rules I can use. Yeah. So you could try to impl implement it some other way, but, but there is a... So, so yeah, this is intuitionistic. Yeah. Okay. okay, so let's go through some of these. Uh, 
Uh, okay, just a remark that I've only said what I'm after propositions to, but also the proofs correspond to the programs, and normalization of proofs in Jensen style natural deduction corresponds exactly to program deductions, and this really is nice morphism on all levels. It's not just a coincidence that these things happen to work. Okay, so this is how we implement the disjoint union in, in ADDA. We say it's a data type, it has two S and T types as parameters, and there's two ways to produce something in this if you need to choose something in the left component. If you have an S, then you get something, or you can put something in the right component. If you have a T, then you get something in the disjoint union. Uh, so here's the dependent version of this. It's just called the sigma type, where we're not only having two components, but we can have countably many components, or how many components you want. Uh, so it's called a sigma type, and it's written with a sigma to remind us of, of this situation, of just a summation. Uh, we say that sigma n and n a of n is a of 0, or a of 1, or a of 2, etc. Uh, so this is how we declare it in Agda. It's a record this time. So what does this mean? A record has certain fields. If you can fill in the fields, then you have an element of the record. And if you have something in the element, then you can project out the fields. So this particular record has two fields. The first one is called first, and it's type S. So this says that if you have something in sigma ST, then you have an S. And the second field is called second, which uh, tells you that if you have something in sigma ST, then you have something in T of the first field. So you have a witness of S, and the proof that the witness satisfies whatever T represents. So this way, this embodies the, the constructive meaning of existence. You have a witness and a proof that the witness satisfies the property you want. Uh, okay, and then there's some Agda noise. So we want to use comma to introduce pairs, and we don't want to uh, put sigma dot in front of everything, so we open the record. And we want this to be right associated. Uh, okay, but one thing you can do with this is if I choose the T to ignore its argument. So here I have an S, which is a set, and a T, which depends on the S, right? So this is a dependent type. But if the, this T does not depend on the S, then it's effectively just a set as well, right? And my fields tells me that I have something in S. And they have something in second of t or whatever that one is. But if t is ignoring its argument, then this just means I have an s and I have a t. Right? So this way, you get the Cartesian product as a special case of the sigma type, where the second part is ignoring its argument. So we write this with a lambda and underscore ignoring the argument. So it's, it's a bit funny how the existential constructor similarly is the and in this system. It's because we're mixing types and propositions. So sometimes the type really means the domain of discourse, and sometimes it means a proposition. And here, we're treating them both as propositions instead of domain of discourse and proposition. OK, and again, this is right associated. Finally, we want the dependent functions for, for all, but dependent functions are already built into our data. So I've just written an alias here. So I say that if A is a set, if B is a type which depends on A, then I get the new set, which consists of the functions, which, given an x in A, produces something in B of x. Right? So it's a dependent function where the codomain of the function where you get the value depends on what input you put in. Right? So we'll see examples of this in a second. OK. We also declare the empty sum or the empty type, which is a data type with no constructors, right? So it's a data type, and you have to use any of these no constructors in order to construct an element of it. And generally, is a record type with no fields. So in order to construct an element of this, you have to fill all the all of these no fields, right? So why is this why is this not some kind of crazy hack? Well, there's a bit of a crazy hack. <laughs> is there some serious duality between data types and record types? Yeah, these records, they look algebraic to me. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's the recent co algebra story, right? Where the record is defined by its observations, mm -hmm. it's defined by its fields, what you can get out of it, 
and the data type is defined by its intersection rules. Well, still a bit of a hack rate. I mean, why didn't I define this as data instead with one constructor? Could have done that as well. But the, the answer is that with records, you get a nice detail for it. But yes, just make sure that we can, that true, true is true. Let's make sure that we can construct an element. Okay, so I could do it manually, but I could also ask Avila to go search for one for me. And then I could find the one the record type would. Uh, okay, so for what I'm going to tell you next, we also need to talk about relations. So uh, we are identifying propositions and sets, right? So a relation should be something which, given two elements, give me a proposition if they're related or not. But since prop is identified with set, this just means that it's, it's a dependent type depending on two elements of the set. Fine, relevant to be A arrow A arrow set. And here's an example relation uh, less than or equal to on the natural numbers. Uh, so I'm defining this by pattern matching on the numbers again. So I'm saying that 0 is less than y is always true. Successor x less than 0 is always false. And successor of x is less than successor of y if and only if x is less than y. So I'm defining a relation by recursion on, on these numbers using the elimination principle that Neil was talking about in order to define a type like this. So what is it? I don't understand the type of rel. Why is it set arrow sets? Right, because rel takes a set A and it produces a large set because it's all functions into set. So that's why it's a set one here. If type was a type, then it would get shouldn't, true. Shouldn't that be true? I mean, a relation is, a pair is either in the relation or it's not. It's not, you know, the set of ways. Right, so these, so these are proof relevant relations, but it can be more than one way. <coughs> they're spans, right? So they're, so they're spans, if you, if you so turn it around. Spans. Yeah. Okay. They're not jointly monic spans, they're spans. Because we care about what proof it is. So Sometimes this is really useful, I guess. Is basically so two things might be the same as relations, but different as well. Yeah, they, they can be more, more than one proof that two things are related. And how much of the type theory is just saying, well, let's explore what happens if we say that this happens before. Uh, okay, so here are the commands that I'm already using. So I guess this is more for if you want to look this up later. So you can load the file, you can do this case split when you do a pattern matching. You can look at the current goal, uh, and you can give a term. So, for example, it can be useful here. Make this into a hole. I reload the file. <coughs> and now, here I see that I have one goal left. I have to produce a set. I can ask Arda what do I can't really know. And it tells me that x is a natural number, y is a natural number, and I have to produce a set. I can tell, ask Arda what about this. And I just says, well, you have a set, and you have to produce a set. So, I can do that. Okay, any questions so far? Does it make sense? Okay, so now let's go back. And now, I thought I'd just give you an example of how to do things in Agra. So, first I'm going to do it the not so clever way, and then we're going to go back and fix it and do it the clever way. So, there's this. There's two ways you can prove things correct. Right? You could either first do it and then prove it correct, or you can make sure that you produce something which is correct by construction. And this is often the way to go. It's going to make your life easier. But let's pretend that we don't know this and try to do it the not so clever way first. So what I want to do is I want to define a sorting algorithm which is going to take a list. So in the end, down here, I want to define sort, which will go from list of natural numbers to lists of natural numbers. And I'm going to define it first as if I were doing Haskell and then try to prove it correct afterwards. 
So what does it mean to prove it correct? Uh, it means we can define what it means to be sorted, and then I can prove that sort is sorted by saying for every list x, x is the predicate sorted holds for a sort of x. And if I can produce a program of this type, then I have proved that sort is actually sorting. sort in disguise, but where you make the recursion structure specific. So I'm going to define a binary search tree, insert every element of my list into the binary search tree, and then flatten the binary search tree to get the list again. And in the end, I will then have a sorted list. So <coughs> what's the binary search tree? Well, in this variation, it's just a binary tree. So it's either a leaf or it's a node of a left subtree, an element, and a right subtree. <coughs> and now I would like to write an insert function, which takes a p, which is a natural number, it takes a binary search tree, and it produces a binary search tree. So at the back of my mind, I want to make sure that everything in the left subtree is smaller than this element, which is uh, greater than, no, the other way around, I guess. So, Everything to the left should be smaller and everything to the right should be bigger. That's what the search tree property is. But the thing that's going to get us into trouble is that I only know this myself. I haven't told Agda about this. So it's up to me to make sure that I write the right code and then later prove it correct, uh, which is stupid. But let's see if we can do it. OK, so we want to write an insert function. It should take a p and a tree. And we have to produce a binary search tree. Okay, so what should we do? Well, we have to look at the tree to see what we're currently inserting into, right? So let's do a case split on the tree. It's either a leaf or a node. If it's a leaf, then we should make a new tree where we have empty subtrees and only one thing in the node. In this case, let me rename this to this left value right. Okay, so I'm trying to insert p into this tree which has two subtrees and a value. So what should I do? Check if p is less than v. Yes, I have to look if p is less than v or not, right? Because if it's less than v, then I should put it in the left subtree, otherwise I should put it in the right subtree. So, let's so say width p less than <coughs> equal to v. Okay, so by doing a width, I can bring in some extra fact. And now I get the pattern match on this back here. So we will a pattern match on Q. And this has and left on this. Ah. Okay. So what we need to do is we need to define a compare function. Takes two natural numbers and tells me if one is less than edge or not. And here I would look at compare of P and V instead. <coughs> so um, P is less than or equal to V returns a set, but with requires a good again, is that right? Uh, no, it's just that if I want to pattern match on it, I can't pattern match on a set. I can only pattern match on data types. <coughs> okay, so let's do this quickly. <coughs> zero is less than m is always true. So this is value true. Suck m 
to look at them. Sapien less than zero is always false. And here it's what I would result to compare in canon methods. So this is the same as what we had before, but now I'm returning a Boolean instead of a proof of this fact. So that's also going to get us into trouble. But if I want to pattern match on it here, then I have to do this. Okay, so now we can pattern match on Q. And we have two cases. This comparison is either true or false. If it's true, that means we should put it in the left subtree, right? So we construct the node. We insert P into the left subtree. We keep the value and we keep the right subtree. And in the other case, we should put it in the right subtree. So we reconstruct the node, keep the left one, keep the V, and insert into the right subtree. OK, so this way we can insert one value into a binary search tree. And now we can easily insert a whole list of them. Right. Because we have pattern match on the list. If it's empty, then we return the leaf. If it's an x followed by x's, then we insert the x into the result of doing the tree from the rest of them. So informally, this is going to produce a binary search tree because insert at each stage is producing a binary search tree. OK. Uh, so now the next step is to take a binary search tree and get back a list again. Right? So we can flatten one. And how do we do this? We pattern match on the T. <coughs> if it's a leaf, then we have to return the empty list, right? If it's a node of a left subtree, a value of the right subtree, then we can flatten the left subtree. We can concatenate this with the list which starts with a value and then is the result of flattening the right subtree. So I'm flattening the left, I'm putting the value in the middle, and I'm flattening the right. And now I can just write the sort function, sorting the list x's, by first making a tree out of x's, that gets me a binary search tree, and then I can flatten that tree. That gets me a list. This is the standard way to do a tree sort. So we believe that this should work, but we haven't in any way proven that this is correct. I mean, we could try to run it or something. So if I try to sort the list four in front of three, in front of seven, in front of nil, here, then I get the list three, four, seven. Okay, but how do we prove this? So here I've inductively defined what it means to be a sorted list. I'm saying that the empty list is sorted, I'm saying that singleton lists are sorted, and I'm saying that if y followed by x is sorted and x is less than y, then x, y, x is sorted. So I need to say this so that also the y uh, is less than everything here. So let's see if we can do this. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, we're just writing a program of this type, right? So I can pattern match on the x's. Because at the moment, my goal is that flatten of tree of x's is sorted. So I don't know how to prove this without looking at the x's. And in this case, my goal is that nil is sorted, but I have a proof of this. In this case, I still can't make any progress because now I need to know that flatten of insert x or 3 x's is sorted, but I don't know what this is. So I can look at x's again. In this case, I need to know that 
x. I need to know that x followed by the empty list is sorted. That's what this one is doing. And that's where the real thing happens, right? So now I need to know that flatten of insert two things is sorted. And I don't think I can do this immediately. So at this point, I start to think I should probably prove some kind of lemma, right? And what should the lemma be? Well, probably I want flatten to always return yeah. sorted lists, right? Because flatten should start with a binary search tree. So I could try to prove a flatten lemma. It says that for every tree, flatten of tree. is flattered lemma applied to this thing. Okay, but now how can I do flattened lemma? Well again I have to look at the T. about how sortedness <coughs> corresponds to it concatenation of lists. And this is starting to look like a mess. Right? I have to come up with all these lemmas in order to prove the thing that I think is true. And the reason that this is so hard is because I did all the work without worrying about these properties. And then later I tried to prove them. But what I probably should have done is I should have told the type checker what I was doing as I was doing it. And then I would have had an easier time. Let's just abort this. Modify this. And see if we can do it in a more intrinsic way. So this time I'm going to try to take proofs more seriously. I'm not just going to do the proofs as an afterthought, but I'm going to do it throughout the development. So this is the moral of the story in some sense, that your life is easier if you let the type checker help you instead of seeing it as, as an enemy that will try to sh shoot down your sort of proof. So the first thing I will do is that instead of having compare re return a boolean, I will have compare return evidence for x being less than y or y being less than x. That is, I'm proving that the less than relation is total. Total just means that for every x and y, either rxy or y, rx. So, so why is an obvious thing that it would prove? Uh, so it's obvious because I want to upgrade my Boolean compare into a compare that returns evidence. So before, I, I mean, it's not completely obvious, I guess. What we could do is we could go through this, and then when we get to the stage that we design, define insert, we also want to return a proof that we are inserting in the right place. So we need, we need a proof of this fact, which means that compare has to return the right evidence for us. Too. So it's, it's a general good practice to, to actually 
return evidence instead of just returning a random boolean, right? Because the fact that this function returns true is, is useless as right. a witness for anything. Sure. So I'm just upgrading booleans to actual proofs. But the actual definition stays more or less the same. Right? So I want to compare n and m. I look at m. If it's zero, then I either have to produce true or I have to produce something else. So I think I'm going to produce true. And that's all the obvious thing. And here I look at m. So here if it's zero, I have to either produce false or true. I prefer true. This is the right something. And in this case, I have to produce a proof that n is less than m, or a proof that m is less than m. But that's what compare would give me. Let's compare. So we see that the definition is basically the same as before, just that instead of returning true and false here, I'm just returning explicitly the witness, which is trivial because the definition of less than computes to what you want it to be. Okay, so let's see if we can do this again. So here's the binary search trees that we had before. But now I would like to encode into the type that this is really a binary search tree. So I would like to change this to include a lower bound and an upper bound into my type. So in order to do the node case, I need to know if I want to go left or right. So I need to know what the values range is from in my tree. Right. So I try to do this by keeping track of the lowest thing I have in my tree and the greatest thing that I have in my tree. And that way, I know if I should start a new subject to the left or a new subject to the right. But now we see that there's anyone spot that there could be a problem with this. The problem is, what do I start off with if I, if I have no data? Right? Uh, I'm supposed to index these things with elements from my type A, but if I don't know what the type is, then I, I, mean, I could go through my, my list and find the smallest element and find the largest element and add one to it or something like this. But this seems quite ele inelegant, so instead, um, define a new type, which extension of a given relation on A. Which again is a relation on A. I have the old things. So it's not a relation. I'm extending the type A with a new top and bottom element <coughs> so that I can use that to start off my message. extend any relation on A into a relation on the extension of A. How do I do this? Well, I look at X. If it's bottom, then this is always true. Otherwise, I look at Y. Okay, 
Um, so what am I doing? I'm just trying to give myself a little bit more leeway by adding infinity and minus infinity to my time. So I'm use this in my and, and then extending any relation on A into a relation on the extended framework. Infinity really is infinity, and minus infinity is minus infinity. So now let's see if we can do this. This was an, our old definition, but of course it doesn't work because I haven't put in any uh, bounds. So the leaf will work for any lower and upper bounds. So what am I promising? I'm promising that every element in the empty binary search tree are between lower and upper. The node, well, if I have a value v, and if here some lower upper, here I have something which ranges from lower to the value v. In my right subtree, I have something that ranges from the value v to the upper, then I have a binary search tree from lower to upper. Right? So I really want to put the value in the middle. But now this doesn't make sense. I have to make the v come first. Okay, let's see if this makes sense now. So, if I have a value v, I have a binary search tree where all the element ranges from some lower thing to v, and I have another binary search tree where the element range from v to upper, then I get a new binary search tree where everything has range from lower to upper. something from A or maybe the extended A. Uh, I would like to insert it into some binary search tree. So let's assume it's from lower to upper. But this is not going to work, right? Because I need to know that the thing I'm inserting really is between these two things. So I'm going to require a proof that T is greater than lower and it goes to you, I should call this P, P
now the type makes sense. And let's see if we can write the program. So we have a tree, <coughs> a tree for some proofs. And what can we do? Well, we still have to look at the tree to see where to put things, right? Tree is a leaf. We um, want to return a load of something, something, something. The first thing is the value, that should be our P. And now we have to produce a witness that U is <coughs> no. We have a subtree, so here we can use a leaf. This is the fun. to make a binary search tree. I have lots of things. And what I want to do, well, I want to look at P and compare it to V. Okay. And now, this time, I can pattern my tree result of this because it's this joint union. Right? So I can tell if it's from the left or from the right. that P is less than V, which means that we want to put it in the left subtree, right? So, make a node, you keep to V, we have two things. And here, we need a binary search tree from U to V. Good, but the type shaper is smarter than me, right? Um, because this was our goal, this is what I tried to give. But we see that I've exactly messed up the cases, right? So I wanted the binary search tree ranging from upper to V, which already seems suspicious. Uh, but what I have is something from V to lower. So what went wrong? Because I'm claiming that. But, yeah. I go through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I messed up the upper and lower up there. So now let's see if that does work. Okay, and here I have to do some proofs. But I need this. That's exactly what I was given. This, that's exactly what my compare function told me to do. And here I can just return the right subtree unchanged. And here is zero situation. Okay, so I guess I should catch a target. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope you already see that doing it this way, the type checker is actually helping you write the program, right? So I messed up when I defined this, and it wasn't an honest mistake. Uh, I actually meant to do it right, but I didn't. But instead of just continuing and then much later realizing that something is wrong when I try to prove the property I want, I get told about it at the point of where I make the error. So this way I could fix it immediately, and now I know that this insert function is doing what it's supposed to do because it's recorded in the type of the function. And then you can move on and do the same steps as we did before. You can move on and define the type of order list in the same way. And in the end, you get the sorting function which takes a list <coughs> and produces an ordered list. So you don't have to prove anything at this point because the correctness of the function is already encoded in the type of it. Right? And all the way you get your hand held by the type checker instead of fighting it at the end. Okay, so I'm sorry I didn't have time to do as much as I wanted, but 
I hope it was helpful. Yes.